Well, hello. My name is Angel Wood, and this is Crime of the Truest Kind. true crimey things did you listen to or watch since the last time we spoke? Well, the Night Stalker, the hunt for a serial killer. I loved that the neighborhood came together to capture Richard Ramirez. Vigilante justice. Director Tiller Russell did a really nice job with it. He's done a lot of work, including The 7-5. Did you see that? It's a documentary about dirty cops in New York City. Corrupt cops in 1980s Brooklyn. What a surprise. Well, the Night Stalker is aesthetically beautiful. And the story, well, it's grim as shit. And I, like you, listen to a lot of true crime stuff and think I know a lot about serial killers, but there are things I did not know about the Night Stalker. So watch the four-part series when you get a chance, if you have not. But not alone in the dark. Your Honor on HBO, drama suspense, solid cast, headed by Brian Cranston, a judge, the mob, Murder. Set in New Orleans. I love that city and I cannot wait to go back. Your Honor is Showtime. Did I say Showtime? It's on Showtime. You might like the flight attendant. It's Kaylee Cuoco from Big Bang Theory. She is the flight attendant involved in an international murder mystery. What else did I watch? Oh, the John Benet Ramsey update on 2020. It told us a little bit more than we already knew. Not much, but a little bit more. I do like that they featured Lou Smith, the detective who worked on the case for many, many years. He became a friend of John Ramsey's, and he believed that the Ramsey family was not involved in her murder in any way. For you, true crimers, my true crimey recommendations. Thank you. You have been listening. I appreciate that big time. Share the show, like, rate, review, follow, subscribe. What else? Enjoy. Enjoy the show. Available everywhere you get your crime stories and crimeofthetruestkind.com. I do have some first-run Crime of the Truest Kind stickers. If you would like one, DM me. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. You can find everything at crimeofthetruestkind.com. Even an email address. I have a phone number, too, that I'll put up. It's a Google Voice number, so it doesn't ring to my cell phone. But I will get your messages. All right. Today we go to Hopkinton, Massachusetts. In the story of Neil Entwistle. A happy family murder. Hopkins in Massachusetts, small town, 17 miles east of Worcester and 26 miles west of Boston. The census as of 2010 say there were just under 15,000 people living there. The racial makeup of the town is 93.1% white, 48% of the nearly 5,000 households had children under the age of 18 living with them, and 70.5 were married couples living together. Small town, family friendly. We get that. In 2020, SafeWise Home Security named it the safest city in Massachusetts. Among that survey listed its population as 18,516. Very low crime. And there had not been a murder in Hopkinton for 11 years until 2006. No one famous is from Hopkinton. Well, a few of my radio DJ friends are, but I don't know that they want you to know that. Dennis Eckersley is from Hopkinton, Major League Baseball pitcher, Baseball Hall of Fame, and he still has a beautiful head of hair and that sweet 80s porn mustache. Two PGA golfers, Keegan Bradley and John Curran. I would not know them if I fell over them on the street. Same goes for Sasha Sloan, a singer I had never heard of, who got nominated for Boston Music Awards this year. It's funny how that happens. The town of Hopkinton is famous for one major thing. It is the starting line of the Boston Marathon that takes place on Patriot's Day, a Massachusetts state holiday, every April, outside of a global pandemic, of course. It remains to be seen if there will be a 2021 Boston Marathon. We're getting a new mayor. Mayor Marty Walsh has joined the Biden administration and will be leading the Labor Department. Godspeed to you, Marty. 
They did cancel this year's St. Patty's Day Parade in Southie. It's known for being a puke and piss fest. Don't write me letters. The town also became known as the site of the January 20th, 2006 double murder of a young mother and her infant daughter. Rachel and Neil Entwistle were a happy couple. New parents to Lillian Rose, born April 2005. They'd moved to Rachel's native Massachusetts to be closer to her family, and Neil was looking to make a go of it in the U.S. Rachel Elizabeth Souza, born in the South Shore town of Weymouth, Massachusetts, on December 14, 1978. When she was little, she told her mother that she wanted to be a Supreme Court justice. Her interest shifted a bit, and she graduated from Silver Lake Regional High School in Kingston, Massachusetts, in 1997. Friends who grew up with Rachel remember her as friendly and very intelligent. She had lots of friends and a bright future. She stayed local for college, attending Holy Cross in Worcester. And in 1999, she went to England for her junior year under the Holy Cross program with the University of York in the city of York, England. Think closer to Leeds than London. In one hour from Worksop, a small working class coal mining town where many sports stars and footballers were from, but maybe the most famous Worksopian, is that a thing, Worksopian? The most famous person from Worksop is Bruce Dickinson of Iron Maiden, singer of one of the greatest heavy metal bands in the entire world. Runs up. Fun fact also, Bruce's cousin is Rob Dickinson from the Catherine Wheel. I send that out to all of the WFNX listeners who now are true crimers. Also from Worksop, John Parr. Known in certain circles for the theme song to the 1985 hit movie, St. Elmo's Fire. He followed that with another moderate hit, Naughty Naughty. I will let you YouTube that. While at York, Rachel became the coxswain of the rowing team. She was the coach. One of the members of the team was Neil Entwistle. Both were avid rowers. The time they spent on the river brought them together. It was sort of romantic in normal circumstances. The university's boathouse would turn out to be on Love Lane. And by normal circumstances, I mean that when you retell the story of your meeting, it's because your husband of three years didn't murder you in your bed. Aunt Wilson was a good student. He made good grades, scored high in math and science. His name graces a plaque in the school's assembly hall, honoring those who went to university. Neil Entwistle had been the poster boy back home at his high school. His success was held as inspiration to thousands of students since he graduated in 1997. His star did dim, though. While he did work hard in college, he offered little to stand out. Carol Eisen, a friend who met Rachel that year at York, took an immediate liking to her and remembers how she was on the crew team. She sat at the end of the boat and yelled things, teaching them how to row. And she loved it. She started to get to know Entwistle, a college boy from that coal mining town of Worksop. Friends called Entwistle clever with computers. He was technologically savvy. He was a bright student and the first among his working class family to attend university. He was studying for a degree in engineering when he met Rachel, a beautiful young girl from America. They began to spend more and more time together. And when she was into him, he was known to say ridiculously romantic things to people like she was the girl he would spend his life with. They'd met at that small green boathouse on Love Lane. It was just past the 12th century chapel where people who had fallen victim to the Black Death were buried. A little less romantic, I guess. Though if you're listening to this, Black Death probably intrigues you a little bit. I can relate. She was my cox and I her stroke. That means different things in England. Neil Entwistle wrote that on a British website about his American girlfriend. They were in love. There was no hiding it. For Rachel, Neil Entwistle was a knight in shining armor, one of her longtime friends told the Boston Globe. On the website friendsreunited.co.uk, he had written, Getting married to the most amazing woman in the world this summer, Rachel. She was petite at five feet, an English major, at university for a year from America. She brought light to the gray English days. He, the electronic engineering student, a foot taller than she was, he seemed to just worship her. And anyone who knew them would never have predicted what was to come. 
Everyone thought they were perfect for each other. When her junior year came to an end, Rachel returned home in the summer of 2000, preparing for her final year at Holy Cross. As soon as she could, she returned to York straight away and enrolled in a teacher training program. She and Entwistle picked up right where they had left off in the summer of 2000. Two years passed, and they got married at the historic Plymouth Plantation. It was August 10th, 2003. It was in Plymouth, near her hometown. Plymouth is another beautiful New England coastal town, known for the Pilgrims and Plymouth Rock, a popular attraction for tourism. They danced to Come What May from the Moulin Rouge soundtrack. Friends said he adored her. The way he looked at her, you knew it would be forever, they'd say. After the wedding, they moved into a two-story, three-bedroom brick house in Droitwich. It was about two and a half hours away from Worksop. Rachel was teaching school, and Entmussel worked at Kinetic, a defense technology company. In a piece for NBC News called The Light in the Upstairs Bedroom by Dennis Murphy, which was obviously an episode for TV, but I could only locate the transcript online. It was from 2008 while the trial was taking place, and we get a closer look at the lives of Rachel and Neil. They moved into a modest flat in the Midlands of England. Aunt Whistle, who'd earned a master's degree in electrical engineering by then, got a job as a computer specialist with a large defense contractor. Rachel was loving her job teaching English and drama at a Catholic school. She was enjoying it. She liked being a teacher. On rachelandneil.org, pre-Facebook days, of course, Aunt Whistle had created a website to feature photos of the two of them for her family and friends in the States. The site doesn't exist anymore, of course. But it does show a very happy life for the newly married couple. Everything changed for them on April 9th, 2005 with the arrival of a beautiful baby girl they named Lillian Rose, or Lily Bean, as they called her. It's a very cute nickname. It's also my dog's nickname. I'm good at rock and roll references, and I'm also good in throwing in a story about my dogs at any turn. The site was a constant source of happiness, showing her grandparents back in Massachusetts how happy and healthy she was. While the photos did bring them joy, Rachel's mother Priscilla and her stepdad Jill Matarazzo wanted to be closer to their granddaughter. And Rachel wanted to come home. She wanted to raise the baby where she grew up and be close to her mom. Aunt Whistle agreed to give it a go. In the summer of 2005, he left that job for what he called domestic reasons. And their little family moved to the States to a town called Carver, Massachusetts and stayed with Rachel's family. In the months that followed... The Ant Whistle spent much of the best days of the New England summer outside, taking trips, including hopping on a ferry and going to Martha's Vineyard, highly recommended. They continued to share photos on their website, showing a growing lily. They'd close their post signing off, Love, the Happy Family. In January of 2006, they had found a big colonial house in Hopkinton on Cubs Path, an hour's drive from her parents. They signed a three-month lease on the new house, and it was $2,700 a month. The house at Six Cubs Path in Hopkinton was bougie, and it was huge. Located in the area called Roosevelt Farms, it sits on the end of a cul-de-sac, a perfectly private setting in a much-desired family neighborhood. Four bedrooms, three and a half bathrooms, 2,400 square feet, and a current value of $646,000. According to Zillow, the real estate site, it sold in October 2007, nearly two years after the murders, for $480,000. It had been on and off the market in 2014, and it finally sold again in 2015 for $500,000. The events of that day in 2006 faded from memory, though the murders had created a problem for the people who owned the home at the time. They had rented the house to the Ant Whistles for $2,700 a month, and it took a very long time until a family occupied that house again. Taylor Adams wrote a piece for the Boston Globe in 2010 called, If These Walls Could Speak, They Would Say, Welcome to a Happy Home, Where Something Terrible Once Happened. That's the title. Where they talk about how the Adams family bought the house after the 2006 murders. While what happened in that house that day had little impact on the lives of the Adamses, 
There is a particularly poignant closing to the piece. Taylor writes, But a sense of meeting in place is relative. My parents say they occasionally see someone, a relative of the deceased, they think. Drive up near the house in the same white Lexus, sitting for ten minutes before slowly turning away. My father said he had thought about inviting them in, but so far he hasn't. That house, or rather the people who occupied its address for ten days in 2006, in the events that house witnessed, mean a great deal to many people. That is one of the most important things we should all remember while we tell these crime stories. People have died, but so many are forced to go on living, living with the knowledge that someone who was supposed to love them and want to keep them safe killed them, and there was nothing that they could do to stop it. I believe houses need to be inhabited. Maybe I'm nuts, but I think about that when I see an empty house. There was a house in my town that sat empty for years and years and years. And I didn't know the story. And I still don't know the story. But one day, a family moved in. And they fixed it up. And they painted it. And they put a new door on. And they made it beautiful. And I felt happy for the house. I wish for that house to have happy people inside. It's sort of the mission of a house. To take care of the family inside. Boston crime writer Michelle McPhee wrote a book about the Entwistle case, which I will talk about later. She spoke of the choice to rent this luxurious home, saying, It was huge by many people's standards. It had four bedrooms. They could take a jacuzzi under the stars. And to fill up the garage, they leased a white 2004 BMW X3 SUV. It was a far cry from the way Neil Entwistle grew up. His was a fiercely private household, and Brits are known for that stiff upper lip, they call it. He was raised in Worksop, working class, a former coal mining community in central England. Outsiders were not welcome at the family's modest brick home on Coleridge Road. Neighbors said that Neil and his brother Russell rarely had friends come over, if ever. They played with each other, and sometimes with their mother. Neil was jobless and looking, and they had a huge house to furnish, 2,400 square feet, in fact. They had no money. The Entwistles bought $6,000 worth of furniture in the days before the murder, and they leased that BMW for nearly $500 a month, all charged to credit cards. Rachel told her mother that Entwistle was in charge of the finances and believed he had money saved in an offshore account, air quotes, Priscilla Matarazzo thought her daughter's husband worked secretly for the British government. I guess that's what he would have everyone believe. Rachel had been busy getting the house in order for their very first dinner party for their friends that Saturday. But when Joanna Gately and her sister Maureen arrived at Six Cubs Path on January 21st, 2006, the house was quiet. The only light they saw came from the upstairs master bedroom. The two women knocked at the door, looked to see if there was any movement inside the house. They saw nothing, and no one, except for one thing. Well, two things. Sally, their basset hound, was in the house. It was odd because Rachel wouldn't leave her alone for a long time. And there was a handwritten note on the front door. It was from Rachel's mother, Priscilla Monterazzo. She'd been at the house earlier in the day for a planned lunch with Rachel and Lily, but no one was there. The Entwistle's only car, that BMW, was gone, and the garage door was locked. Finding that note was so unsettling to Joanna that she called Rachel's mother on her cell phone. No one knew what to think. It was a mystery and completely out of character for Rachel. And here is what we learned happened. The information comes from the affidavit of Massachusetts State Trooper Michael Banks. On Saturday, January 21st, 2006, at approximately 8.27 p.m., Rachel's friend Joanna Gately of Cambridge, Massachusetts, that's just outside of Boston, home of Harvard University, MIT, several others, they came to the Hopkinton Police Station to report a possible missing person or the need for a well-being check at a house in Hopkinton. Joanna Gately told police she went to Six Cubs Path in Hopkinton, the home of Rachel and Neil Entwistle, and their nine-month-old daughter Lillian for a planned visit and to have dinner. She explained that when she got there, the home appeared to be occupied. 
She did see some lights on, but all the doors were locked, and their dog was home alone. At approximately 8.35 that evening, Hopkinton police officers Michael Sutton and Aaron O'Neill responded to that location. An officer used his Blockbuster Video membership card to jimmy the front door. This is not funny, but I find that funny. Blockbuster Video membership cards are antiques now. They looked around the house, took two steps into the bedroom, and conducted a brief walkthrough of the home. Finding no one inside and seeing no signs of foul play in the residence, the officers left and secured the premises. I do hope they took that dog out for a wee. Look at me, I mention England and all of a sudden I'm a Brit. I'm not making fun. They noted no sign of forced entry and the premises appeared to be secure. During the walkthrough, the officers did notice lights were on, food and plates were laid out as if the family was getting ready for a meal, and their car was not in the attached garage. The officers spoke with Rachel's mother, Priscilla. She told officers that the Entwistles only had one car, that leased BMW, and that she had last spoken with Rachel on Thursday evening, January 19th, but had been unable to reach her since then, despite a number of attempts. Mrs. Matarazzo told police that her husband, Neil Entwistle, lived there. He was a UK citizen, and that his family is from Worksop, England. Now, much like the story of Chris Watts, true crimers know this one, the man in Colorado who murdered his entire family because he had a new girlfriend. The family annihilator story. Shannon Watts had a friend, Nicole, who was all about how off this was for her friend and made sure to step in and find her. There is another similarity with the Watts and Entwistle cases that I will get to, so stay with me. So much like Shannon Watts' friend, Nicole, who was very concerned about how messed up everything was, Joanne Gately and her sister, Maureen, were so bothered by what was going on that they slept in their car in the driveway of Rachel's house that night, waiting for them to come home. They never did. The following day, Sunday, January 22nd, Priscilla Matarazzo came to the Hopkinton Police Department to file a formal missing persons report. She had returned to Rachel's house and Joanna Gately had gotten inside through the garage after getting a door code from the neighbor and hopefully to let the doggy out for some food and a wee. I am that person who when I hear a tragic story and there's a pet involved, I always worry about the pet. And while I am concerned about Sally in this story, it was 15 years ago and Sally has long crossed the Rainbow Bridge. Hopkinton Police Sergeant Sutton and Detective Vin Ralton went to Six Cubs Path to conduct another walkthrough of the home. Upon entry, the officers detected a smell, which could have been attributed to dirty diapers. When they got to the upstairs bedroom, the officers found a bed in the master bedroom to be unkempt, as the affidavit states, as if someone had slept in the bed and had not made it, and then laid the comforter and other bed linens back on the bed. Think of like when you have a boatload of laundry that you have to fold and put away. It's just piled up. There was a big pile of linens on top of the bed. Sergeant Sutton lifted the comforter, saw a foot, and then lifted the other end of the comforter and saw the body of a female lying on her side in the fetal position, obviously deceased. Officer Sutton then pulled back the left side of the comforter and saw the body of an infant next to the female's chest laying on her back, also obviously deceased. There appeared to be indications of trauma to the baby's face, including a contusion on her left eye, her nose, and her mouth area, and blood and mucus on the infant's nostrils. Officers immediately placed the comforter back over the bodies, called for assistance, and began securing the premises. What they learned is that the bodies of Rachel and Lillian had been completely covered by bedding and no part of their body had been visible. It took the officers moving the bedding to discover that there were bodies in the bed. Sergeant Sutton testified to that, that he saw a small baby's face next to her mother under the duvet of the bed on the evening of January 22nd. The officer told the Middlesex Superior Court that he did not see the two bodies when he first looked in the master bedroom on January 21st, but returned at around 6 p.m. the following evening. He said he immediately noticed an odor as he entered through the basement of the home and followed the smell to the master bedroom where he walked to the far side of a queen-size bed. He noticed there was a woman's wristwatch and reading glasses lying on the floor, which he had not been able to see from the position of the doorway on the initial search the night before. 
the officer said he lifted up the bottom corner of the duvet approximately six inches. Now, at first, it appeared Rachel and Lily had died of possible carbon monoxide poisoning because there did not seem to be very obvious injuries. He said nothing else appeared to be out of place, but the bed was thrown together. It was their brand new queen-size four-poster bed. The officers began to search for other victims. It was evident to them that there was possibly a man in the family, as there were many family photos around the home. But no one else was found. And Neil Entwistle was MIA. Daddy was gone. By 7 p.m., Mass State Police at Logan Airport were contacted, and the search was on for Entwistle's 2004 white BMW X3 with a roof rack. Neil Entwistle was the man of the hour, and police wanted to find him, stat. State police located the BMW within the hour and found it in the West Garage Level 4 at Logan. It had been there since at least midnight on Saturday, January 21st. A baby's car seat was visible in the rear passenger side of the car. The driver's side seat was in the reclined position, and there was no parking receipt to be seen. We did learn later that Entwistle slept in the car as he waited for his flight time to escape back to London. The BMW was secured and transported to Massachusetts State Barracks Terminal D at Logan Airport, East Boston, for further examination. Massachusetts State Police Lieutenant James Connolly learned that Neil Entwistle left the United States on Saturday, January 21st, on British Airways Flight 238 to London, England, which departed Logan at 8.15 a.m. on January 21st. That's the day before the bodies were found in their bed in Hopkinton. They also learned that Entwistle purchased a ticket for 2.38 p.m. on that Saturday, but instead took the 8.15 a.m. flight to London. That indicates to me that as soon as he decided he was going to leave, he wanted to get out of there as soon as possible. Think about it. The longer he waited to leave, the greater the likelihood was that they would figure it out, find him, and catch him. Lieutenant Connolly further learned that Entwistle purchased the ticket with a Visa debit card only about one hour before the 8.15 a.m. flight, that it was a one-way ticket, and that he checked no baggage. Shortly after midnight on January 23rd, a Framingham District Court clerk issued a search warrant for the Entwistle house. State, local police, and forensic experts began execution of that warrant at approximately 1.10 a.m., there was much work to get done, and they worked straight through the night. An officer on the scene spoke with the State Police Crime Scene Services, and the preliminary examination indicated that the baby had what appeared to be a single gunshot wound to the chest and another wound in her back, as if the gunshot went through her body. Rachel had what appeared to be a gunshot wound to the chest. It wasn't obvious at first, and those at the scene could not see any gunshot wounds on the baby until her body was moved away from Rachel's side. They were laying together on the bed, and Lily died in Rachel's arms. When the medical examiner's office conducted an x-ray, it showed what appeared to be a single projectile in Rachel's chest. This is the initial finding before the autopsies were done. They note that neither a gun nor any shell casings were found in the house during the execution of the warrant. During the execution of the warrant, officers noticed numerous financial documents and bank records throughout the home. Trooper Michael Banks noticed some data storage disks and a laptop. The laptop computer at Toshiba was secured by officers executing the search warrant and removed from the premises. In addition, officers observed a second laptop computer, also at Toshiba. That computer is also removed from the premises. And guess what is about to happen? Yes, computer forensics. Get psyched. An officer at the scene reported that the bodies of the female and the baby found on the premises appear to be of those in the photographs, Rachel and Lillian Entwistle. Rachel had been setting up a home. There are family photographs all over the house. You could not miss them. Autopsies were conducted on Tuesday, January 24th, four days since they were killed revealing that Rachel was shot in the head. 
The wound discovered in the center of her forehead just above the hairline was hidden in plain sight. A state police forensic chemist testified at trial in graphic detail that Lily was shot with a 22 caliber Colt revolver that was pressed to her body. A contact shot. It passed through her body and entered Rachel's chest. She also had bruising on her face. That revelation was met with a collective gasp in the courtroom, horrific for her loved ones to hear. Lillian's pink and green polka-dotted footy pajamas were covered with blood, and there was a quarter-inch hole through her pajamas in the area of her torso, which were singed by the bullet as it tore through her body and into her mother's. The immediate cause of death of Lillian, as listed on the official copy of the record of death, was gunshot wound of abdomen with liver and kidney, a contributing condition listed preferation, meaning the bullet went through her organs. This information shocked the courtroom, but it also drew some emotion from the killer, her father. During the same testimony, the state's forensic chemist also found sperm cells. My brain did a record scratch when I heard that. What? The floral print underwear that Rachel had been wearing tested positive for blood evidence near the inside crotch area of the garment. The underwear also tested positive for sperm cells on three separate areas of the crotch, but did not test positive for seminal fluid. Now, initially when I read sperm cells were found, I jumped to conclusions like, what the what? I mean, it would not be an unlikely scenario that if someone was murdered, perhaps other things happened leading up to said murder. But when investigators questioned Entwistle about the couple's sex life, he said he had had sex with his wife for the last time on Wednesday, two days before she dies. But he could not have left his DNA on her. Testimony in the case has shown that sperm cells with Entwistle's DNA were found. On Rachel's green and blood-covered shirt, more sperm cells were found, and her shirt tested positive for lead in a gunshot residue test. The recovered projectiles were sent to the state police crime lab for examination by a ballistician. The bullet that was in Lily's torso was intact, while the bullet from Rachel's head was broken in two pieces. Both came from a 22 caliber. While it is still early in this investigation, police will continue to connect a lot of dots. Rachel and Lily were at home, shot in their bed, and whomever did it took the gun and shell casings and left. Hmm. The father lives in the home. He appears in all the photographs. He's gone. The car's gone. Where could he be? This is interesting. I hadn't heard this about the case until finding the affidavit. On the evening of Monday, January 23rd, State Trooper Robert Manning called the home of Joseph Matarazzo, stepfather of Rachel Entwistle. Mr. Matarazzo told Trooper Manning that he had received a phone call that morning from Clifford Entwistle, father of Neil, from his home in the UK. Mr. Entwistle told Mr. Matarazzo that his son Neil called him last night, which it appears was Friday night, and that Neil said during the conversation he had gone out for 20 minutes Friday morning that he came back to the house and found his wife and daughter in the bedroom, that he called the police and the police arrived at the house at 1 p.m. He went to Joe Matarazzo's house but could not find them, so he drove around, that he was so confused and was trying to piece things together and got to the point that he could not face them, so he drove to the airport, called his father, and told him he wanted to come home. Mr. Entwistle told Mr. Monorazzo that he saw Neil on the morning of Monday, January 23rd, and he had arrived in the UK. Mr. Monorazzo also told Trooper Manning that a few minutes after his telephone call with Mr. Entwistle, Neil Entwistle called and spoke to him about what happened with Rachel and Lillian. On the afternoon of Monday, January 23rd, the officer investigating the case contacted Neil Entwistle in England. The two spoke for approximately two hours, during which time Entwistle said he woke up on the morning of January 20th at about 7 a.m., fed his daughter Lillian, and then left the house at about 9 a.m. to do errands. He went to Staples and headed to but never made it to Walmart and then back home at about 11 a.m. 
He had left the outer garage door open, so he went into the garage and inside the house where he found it in the same condition as when he left. He went upstairs, checked the baby's room, did not see her there, went into the master bedroom and saw his wife partially covered with the comforter. He pulled down the comforter, saw his wife was pale, saw blood on the baby, and that the baby had been shot, and they were dead. Pulling the covers back over them, he went downstairs, grabbed a knife from the kitchen, and considered killing himself, but then put it down because, as he told the officer on tape, it would hurt too much. He decided to drive the car to Carver to tell his in-laws what happened, since he had no number to call them. Keep in mind, he lived with them in their house for a period of months. The other reason he made the hour drive to Carver from Hawkington was to try and get a gun at the house of Joseph Matarazzo to shoot himself, but found no one there and he was not able to get inside the house. Aunt Musil said he thought about driving to his mother-in-law's job, but couldn't remember how to get there. Then he drove to the airport, walked around, left the airport, started driving back to Hopkinton, ended up buying gas with a credit card, then going back to the airport and taking a flight to England. He flew to Heathrow, rented a car, drove to his parents' house, and told them what happened. His statements to police about Rachel and Lillian's condition when he found them dead and the condition in which he left them are inconsistent with what officers and other investigators saw at the crime scene. In particular, Aunt Muzzle stated that when he went up to the bedroom, he saw blood on the baby and saw that both his wife and his daughter had been shot. He claims to have covered them with the blanket and then left the room. When investigators found them, however, Lillian's face was covered with a pillow and there was no immediate visible evidence that either Rachel or Lillian had been shot. Rachel's arm was draped across the baby's torso, covering the entrance wound on the front of her body. It wasn't until they moved the bodies that they could actually see a gunshot wound in both the baby and Rachel. And the gunshot wound to Rachel's head was not discovered until the autopsy. The entrance wound was above her hairline, and there was minimal bleeding. That blood and bodily fluid stained pillow was seized. New information from Entwistle's statement made the pillow even more relevant to the investigation at that time. Did Entwistle smother Lily with the pillow? It wasn't her cause of death. We know that she was shot and that caused her death. But what was the pillow doing there and how did she get the contusions on her face? During this phone call, Entwistle provided information about his employment status as well as his finances. At the time, he was unemployed and was looking for full-time work. He stated that he needed permanent income because living expenses, particularly the house. He claimed to have had a job interview scheduled at a company whose name was redacted from the affidavit on Friday, January 20th, but it did not work out and he had not told his wife. He had been inquiring about employment through an unnamed recruiting agency. He said he had done some selling on eBay and told the officer that he and Rachel had been living in England, where he did military research for Kinetic in Malvern, England. Aunt Whistle wanted to try to live in both countries, but Rachel wanted to be closer to her mother. She wanted Lily to be raised as an American. She was, as he put it, more family-oriented than he was. They left England for the U.S. in late August 2005. On January 24th, two days after Rachel and Lily were found, officers with both the state police and Hopkinton police spoke to Rachel's mother, Priscilla, and her husband, Joseph Matarazzo. They wanted more background information to help in the investigation. Mrs. Matarazzo said she didn't know what Entwistle did for work when they lived in England. It was their belief that he had some type of secret government job that he could not talk about. Oh, hold on, that has the fresh smell of a red flag. Everyone who knew Neil Entwistle began to realize that they did not know Neil Entwistle. Matarazzos were also unsure of the Entwistle's financial situation. And according to Priscilla, even Rachel was unsure about it. Rachel would tell her that she would ask him questions about their finances, but he refused to discuss it. This was a major source of conflict in their relationship. Rachel told her mom that her husband had English credit cards, but when she attempted to use any of them, they had been frozen. 
Rachel had been led to believe that their money was tied up in some offshore accounts related to his UK job. Reports were that he claimed to be living on $10,000 a month from some mysterious account. Rachel was also led to believe they had plenty of money, enough to buy a house for cash or certainly make a large down payment. But they did not have access to this money for some reason. When Rachel tried to ask questions about their finances, she was assured that everything was fine and their family's financial future was solid. Okay, stop. If you are shut out of the financial conversation by your partner, this is what we call a motherfucking red flag. The investigation was digging deeper into potential motives. Why would a man who, by all outward signs, was a doting dad and loving husband want to kill his family? That is an excellent question, and one that we will answer in the second half of Neil Entwistle, The Happy Family Murder, Hopkinton, Massachusetts. Please subscribe to the show. Please rate it. Please review it. Tell your other true crime or friends about it. Sharing is caring. It will help us grow. Thank you for listening. It's great to have you. Follow the show online. Like the Facebook page, Crime of the Truest Kind. Instagram, Crime of the Truest Kind. Twitter, at Truest Kind. There is a TikTok, but I think it remains set at private. I will adjust that and you will see... Some of my dog videos, among other things. I have another show, too. It's Boston and New England music. It's called Boston Emissions, and you can find it really on most platforms in bostonemissions.com. All right, my name is Angel Wood. Thank you so much for listening. This is Crime of the Truest Kind. Until next time, lock your goddamn doors. Goddamn doors.